Hey, Tommy, have you noticed that car design has changed in a seismic way over the last several years? Yeah, I mean, it's really evolved with the evolution of electric cars and a lot of newcomers in the segment. Yeah, I mean, look at the Cybertruck, dude. It just blew current car design right out of the water, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about design today because we've got a very special guest. Yeah, he's a seasoned automotive designer. He's done... Seasoned? I think you'd hate that term. I'm going to go with experienced, accomplished, seasoned. He's not a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> he may not be a turkey, but he is one talented designer. This is Chris Chapman. He's got experience as lead designers across multiple brands. Yeah, his, uh, he's a senior... Uh, I'm reading it right here. Chief designer for Hyundai Design North America. Uh, But his background goes all the way back to the first BMW X5. Can you believe that? We actually had that car. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great design. He's done a lot of the recent Hyundai products from the uh, Kona to the Sonata. So we're going to have a little bit of a chat with him and learn about where design's going and how he's been influenced. Yeah, and it's more than that. You know, I talked with him as we're going through this crisis, right? And uh, he talked about how that is also affecting people and how that is going to affect design in the future. So if you are into cars, like we are, uh, and if you feel that form follows function or if it function follows form, we're going to get deep into how car design is evolving and how electric cars and how crossovers are going to look in the future. So what do we say we just cut to that interview right now? Yeah, let's do it. Sit back and relax or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. All right, Chris, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk uh, with me. Uh, And before we kind of get into the design part of this conversation, kind of tell me about your background so that the people out there know kind of the, the journey you've taken to where you're at right now. And, and tell me about your studio and, and, you know, just give us a background of yourself, please. Well, I'm um, a Southern California native, uh, born and raised in Pasadena. I went to Art Center for, for design school. Um, I've been pretty much here all my life as a, either a studio contributor as far as design is concerned or a manager or a director, except for uh, a couple of years, my family and I, we moved to, to Munich, Germany when I was working for BMW and we got to experience that sort of end of the business, the mothership, um, which was a really great experience for not only work, but life in general, and then came back. And then, um, after 18 years with BMW, um, uh, moved on to uh, Hyundai Motor Group about eight years ago now. And so since then, been down in uh, Orange County, Southern California, uh, working um, with that group um, to develop the next generation of wonderful uh, solutions for mobility, if you will. So uh, we're, we're full steam ahead. And in the last three years, I would say, we've, we've made a, a product onslaught, uh, just an assault, uh, just so kind of redefining the company and, and really uh, just making some really wonderful products out there, which is really why I, I initially joined the company in the first place because I saw what they were doing back in you know 2008 and 2012 I joined and I just was very curious about reinventing uh, what I was doing as a designer with uh, plenty of room of innovation in front of me. So it was just a, a really uh, a great time to join the company and, and then we've had some um, movement on the executive level in design over the last three years. And we've got a, just an in, infusion of, of, you know, international experience, uh, people. And uh, it's just been a, a really great, great ride so far. So tell me, uh, let's start with the BMW stuff before we move on to what you're doing now. Um, yeah. You designed the second generation of the X5, if I remember right. No, I was personally... Third, the third gen- which gen? First, the first generation, and okay. then um, as I became director, I was involved with the, directing the second generation and the third generation. But actual my design in input for that thing, I was the I'm the grandfather of the original the original X5. So uh, yeah, I've been around for a long. But all, all pretty much all of the the X vehicles for a, a long period of time through I think. Oh, let's see, the second generation X6 or whatever were more or less originated out of the California studio at Design Works here. So um, we were kind of, you could almost call us at the time, really the studio which was originating all of the X vehicles for a long period of time. So it's a, 
it's been a great run there. And, and I think it was appropriate to this market in this region in North America. Yeah. When, when you were given kind of the, the reins of the X5 uh, and you were given um, a design, I guess, direction, was it pretty open in terms of where you could go with it? Because I'm looking at the German competitors at that time, right? We had the basically the ML, which uh, the Mercedes did, uh, and that was more of a traditional body on frame crossover. Um, yeah. Whereas the X5 was more of, well, BMW called it the sport utility vehicle, right? So it took a very different direction right from the get-go. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I can go back a little bit further. Before my, my time at, um, at BMW, I sort of did, let's call it boot camp at Isuzu, and I learned how to do SUVs, basically. So, Did you do anything um, with the vehicle cross? Was that, was that yours? Yeah, or? I did. We worked on the, the XU1, actually. It was a black four-door gull-wing disc SUV that actually uh, was in the 1993 Tokyo Motor Show. It won best of show, I guess, uh, which was really great for us. But on the heels of that concept, I was, um, I was able to sort of take whatever experience that I had gained after – almost four years at Isuzu and brought it into, into BMW. So doing a truck, um, doing an SUV, doing a pickup truck, even it takes some time to learn uh, how to do. And you, you sort of learn the, the basic architecture of where it all kind of comes from. And, and you, and you also can spot very quickly where the formula isn't working. And it, it's, it's with say certain other companies that when they don't understand what a real truck is or what the architecture is, um, you can see really quickly where it's it's going to kind of fall apart. So I applied the learnings that I had from Isuzu, the years at Isuzu, to the X, X5. So when I came into BMW, they were kind of all over the place, and they were they had done some models and they had done some um, some form studies that were really um, not really, let's say, sticking to what a truck what a truck is. And I think people in general they could recognize that immediately so you'll, you'd see some early offerings from some of the europeans on the suv front or whatever and they they kind of resembled a little bit more of say a car or an mpv kind of a thing um versus a real true and pure suv and so i think the success of the x5 kind of came from my learnings there i mean I, I spent a good year year and a half just getting slapped um for drawing cars at, at, at Isuzu, you know, because they kept saying, oh, it's still a car, it's still there, or it's an MPV, or it's still a monovolume, or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like pulling my hair out because um, I just was slow to the take uh, with, with regard to understanding what a truck is. But as soon as I kind of figured it out and got it, I was able to bring that and then say, okay, guys, what you're doing over here, I think is really uh, kind of the wrong direction. And then I did a, I did a scale model, um, and in three months' time, uh, we were we were blowing that up to full size, and that is basically all it took. And, and we we brought it into into production uh, a year or so later, and then it um, it actually, you know, uh, we we had had the Land Rover group, the Rover, the Rover. Yeah, sure. yeah. So there was a lot of discussion about, well, should we really do this vehicle because it might cannibalize it up against the Range Rover, the L30 at the time and stuff. And so they decided to shelve it for a while. So, um, but then there was something in the sort of German DNA that they said, no, we got to do this vehicle and we got to prove that it can be on road and it can be fast as fast as a five series. So they tested at the Nürburgring um, and they were able to get lap times that were identical, if not beating a five series, but with a car that had a center of gravity that was up high. And so it was sort of this German pride to prove to themselves that they could do such a thing. And it, it was called an SAV when they initially launched it, the sport activity vehicle. Yeah, I remember um, that. Sort of like bring in that sort of new definition. So. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, it's funny, you know, when you did that vehicle, uh, SAVs or SUVs were still kind of on the fringe. And I'm sure at that time, the BMW 3 Series was the best seller for BMW. You know, that accounts for the longest time, like 50% of their sales. And yeah. today you look at what the best selling cars are and they're no longer cars, they're crossovers, right? Cars are being left in the dust and everybody is... Uh, buying crossovers and be that in the premium space like BMW or in the regular space. It's exactly it's yeah. kind of crazy how, how how times have changed. So let's fast forward to uh, what you're doing now. Um, let's talk about the cars that you've done for Hyundai. So what are the one? What's the one you're most proud of? Well, I mean, we're we're coming out with the ones that are that are launching. I mean, um, 
in, in recent times you were with, with us in, in Hawaii and we launched the Kona, um, that was something that originated and uh, our studio in California was kind of responsible for. And I think it brought a lot of character. It was, it's the first Kona. It's the first really compact or, you know, subcompact kind of uh, SUV. And I think it, it really brought in kind of an iconic face and identity and character to the, to the category there. So um, that's probably one of the, one of the first vehicles that I think that I could sort of attach our studio closely uh, with regard to the Hyundai side of things and the Genesis side of things. We're seeing some things that are coming out um, recently with the, with the uh, GB80. Um, I was gorgeous vehicle. I, I remember I was at the LA auto show and you couldn't yeah. get near it. People were, you know, yeah. people yeah. were crowded around it. Yeah. And we've had, we've had a lot of great success and contributions uh, with the, the latest um, Elantra as well. Um, we had some input there, um, albeit uh, mostly from a big proportional standpoint and maybe in the front end. But um, a lot of times our contributions are either sort of the, the whole vehicle is adopted or it's a real team effort globally where we're bringing in a, a silhouette or a proportion or the way this thing stands from our designs and then and then Korea or and or Europe might take it over and, and, and finish off the car. So it's a real collaborative effort, um, more so than ever, I think, because um, there, there's really goods, goods and bads, positive, positives and negatives to every design proposal that gets thrown out there. And rather than sort of, uh, you know, mash it together in kind of a Frankenstein kind of way, I think more and more we're taking the the essence of the concept, the essence of the theme from one studio, but maybe the profile from another studio, but, but it's not so much about like, well, we're going to take the front end of that one and the rear end of that one and stick it on the side view of that one kind of thing. Like they've done in former, former times at a lot of other OEMs over the, over the ages for sure. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, so let's talk about the Kona, you know, um, when you're doing like a X five or even a midsize or full size crossover, it, it, it seems like it, it's a much more natural fit, right? But when you take that and you shrink it down into more of a compact class, yeah. um, design language becomes that much more important because you're losing some of the height because you don't have as big of a vehicle. You're losing some of the size, you're losing some of the presence. So how do you translate that? crossover look into a smaller vehicle to keep it, you know, looking rugged and kind of a little bit off-road worthy. And yet at the same time, you're basically in a very small vehicle. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the same rules apply just on a smaller proportion. Um, you know, for me, what I've learned, what's critical about SUVs and trucks in general is that the A line, which is the fender line of the car runs into the belt line more than it runs into the A pillar. And a lot of times, uh, companies make the mistake and they start to run the A, the A line into the A pillar more. So the relationship is more like an MPV that way. It's really smooth looking, but it loses its rugged appeal. So really it's more of a, a, a capsule or the passenger compartment atop the body, really. So the body is running through the belt line and you get this really strong kind of truck character to it. To it. Um, as far as the size is concerned or the styling, if you will, I mean, crossovers, it's in a name really, or, or crossover utility vehicle or, you know, it, it, it to me spl starts to split hairs, you know. It's really become difficult to take the hatchback out of a, of, a, of a really small SUV. You know, when you're designing one, you're trying to, you know, make it less and less like a car and make it a really clear statement in terms of ruggedness and protective qualities and things that people are, are generally appealed to uh, these days with regard to the customer, but um, it's, it's, it's becoming harder and harder to navigate in between classes of cars and typology of cars, right? So um, with the Kona, we, we really uh, adhered to some of the formal rules of what an SUV kind of stands for, body proportion, glass proportion, like I mentioned, the A-line, uh, protective qualities to the fenders, the wheel spats, things like that kind of give it that rugged look. Um, but with the, with the Kona, it's more about shorter, abrupt lines, uh, all along, all along the car to give it a kind of spontaneous, youthful feel. Whereas like longer cars, like the GV80 go from headlight to taillight, big, long lines, big, long surfaces that are uninterrupted with the Kona. It's a little bit more of a fresher kind of spontaneous feel for that kind of youthful, uh, customer. 
you know, I've gotten to know uh, Mark Allen pretty well over at Jeep, head designer for Jeep. And, uh, you know, he was one of the first designers, I think, or one of the early ones who actually did kind of the design where you take the headlights and you move them below the running lights, right? Which yeah. is the design language that, that you used. And I'm not saying you copied, I'm just saying, you know, the, the Cherokee came out before the Kona, obviously. Sure. Uh, but there was, a, there was a pretty strong backlash against that design where the headlights are lower than the running lights. And eventually they, they kind of went to more of a traditional design. Were you yeah. worried about that at all when you did this kind of, the, I would say the same thing, but a very similar, you know, flipping of where the, those two iconic parts of the car are? Yeah, not, not really. We had been discussing, even in, in the days at BMW, of, of doing less of a face of a car and more like treating it as a machine. So what I mean by that is, you know, you quite often hear designers speak of the car in terms of, of having a face where it has you know, head, the eyes, nose, mouth kind of configuration. It's always about that constellation of, of components or, or uh, parts, if you will. Sure. And we had for a long time been talking about like, let's break this up differently so that, you know, you, when you see this thing coming at you, the first message is that it is a machine uh, for moving people really. And it, it is not about, um, it, it's only evolved into the sort of idea that it's, been sort of an aggressive face or a happy face or an inviting face or an approachable face or whatever, but a face nonetheless. And I think that in particular with electric vehicles where you're starting to see not really a grill in the front, you know, you're seeing a whole different re sort of redefinition of what the front end needs to be in terms of functionality and design. So we're kind of moving away from this idea that it has to have, you know, eyes, nose, mouth, and more into this idea of it needs lights to see at nighttime or be seen. It needs cooling and that doesn't necessarily mean a mouth and it needs an identity, which means not necessarily a grill or a calling card of, a, of some sort in the front of the car. So um, I think uh, you're seeing the manifestation of that thinking as the years, as the years go by. Now, you, actually, you brought, brought it up. That was my next question, you know, with electrification and specifically Tesla, because they're the ones that are kind of in the forefront of that. How is that changing kind of your design language and your uh, work? Uh, because, you know, I think in small ways you've seen like the Germans go and hide the tailpipes, right? So that, that, that you're not showing that part of the vehicle, uh, yeah. making it a little bit more, I guess, politically correct, maybe is a term, but how is it, how is electrification changing the design language that you're using? Because obviously you don't need a radiator, so you don't need to cool the engine. So that, like you said, gets rid of the grill, really allows you a lot more freedom with, with the way that you construct the front of the vehicle. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if I'm going to zoom out just a little bit here and maybe get a little bit philosophical, but um, things are getting serious you know, out there in the world, I think. I think to, to not acknowledge um, the environment, to not acknowledge um, problems, you know, social, civil, uh, you know, civic problems, people have issues. They have problems that need solving in the world. And that's, you start to hear terms like mobility instead of cars. You start to hear terms like autonomous driving or whatever and, and things like that, that sort of, make cold somehow this former world that you and I have always sort of associated with is like love and passion for, you know, horsepower and, and speed and so forth. So yeah, I, I hate with, mobility. It scares me to death. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, and, and, and with that, I think we have seen generation upon generation, let's say the last 30 years plus in, in automotive design um, uh, be sort of labeled as styling. And I think when cars, you know, were first sort of designed, they were designed, um, you looking at, you know, Isigonis with the Mini or, or you know, these, these examples where it was more of an engineer or an architect, you know, uh, putting together, uh, you know, a, a concept. And then the idea of styling it or whatever has only evolved over the years where, you know, in, in, in times and in, say of the fifties and the sixties here in America, where, you know, cars were inspired by the dream of, of space travel or rocketry or whatever that we reflected that you've probably heard, you know, many designers. Sure, big tail fins kind of and big, big lights. Of, yeah. Exhausts. And, it, and it's the, the conversation is actually 
been shrunk down and reduced and, and minimized. And, and now, now designers are talking about, you, know, you hear me even, you're talking about the character of this particular line, how it goes over the front wheel and, and how this one twists there and stuff. And it, you know, it went from rocketry and dream of, of transportation to, you know, sex on wheels to now we're just talking about the subtle innuendo of a, of a door section or whatever. And now, right now, I think you're seeing um, car companies, and I would say Hyundai is part of this, moving out of the idea of being the designer as stylist and now is designer as problem solver, as somebody who should be more of, a, I like to call him a architect, but somebody who's actually now reconnecting with the real problems that are out there in the world and trying to solve them for that. So when you're talking about electrification, getting back on this or autonomous vehicles and so forth, you're talking about solving transportation needs for people. And now it's all of a sudden becomes less about the outward expression of somebody, uh, somebody's personality, what they drive and stuff. And it's more about like, uh, well, how's the aerodynamic coefficient of it and, how much storage and whatever, and a lot of a lot of what we would consider boring topics, but but these are real problems that a stylist can't solve anymore. It has to be more up to a true designer working collaboratively with engineering and and you know um, and marketing for that matter to try to put together a concept, a, a total concept that solves solves a particular problem. So so two so, things, yeah. you know what, what the reason. The word mobility scares me so much is because to me it symbolizes the um, commoditization of transportation right and i look back at like what i guess it must have been like to fly in the 40s and the 50s right where you had these beautiful airplanes and people got dressed up and it was really stylish and it, became, it was just you know this this really experience and even when i was a kid my mom dressed me up in a suit every time we got on a plane right it was special and then the flight attendants brought you entire meals and when you commoditize that, you end up with basically, you know, an Airbus, right? It is an Airbus. It's just, you know, it becomes cheaper. It becomes uh, more um, prominent in everybody's lives. It connects us in some ways, but at the same time, it becomes a lot less uh, enjoyable, passionate, fun, whatever you want to use. It just becomes something you have to do to the point now where you and I were both flying a lot where, you know... I, Every time I had to get on a plane, I pretty much hated it. You know, the, the whole yeah. the whole process from going through the TSA to getting on the airplane was just, you know, it was a necessity you had to do to do your job. There was no nothing fun about it, nothing interesting. You know, the best thing you could say about it is you got to watch a movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I, like I said, you know, these these days, you know, with this whole virus situation, it's kind of hitting a reset button, and and in a way, I was I was mentioning, you know, I, I'm kind of born for quarantine right now because I've traveled so much, but um, traveling is not anymore, like you were mentioning, uh, the dream or, or, or anything. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, I hate it. You know, you, you don't like it. It's very costly. You feel more like a, a cattle, a cattle right. drive or whatever in the thing. And it, it's very, very scary. I think people, I think, I believe heavily Roman in, in the pendulum theory, you know, th things swing into, into a real ex extreme and then eventually something happens with the human spirit that then it comes back into a, a center where it naturally wants to exist. It might swing into another direction the other way eventually or whatever, but I think people can tolerate this kind of stuff only so much before it has to kind of come back to a more human um, you know, and a more relevant answer. Yeah, I, I hope you're right because if you take that model and you um – apply it to transportation and cars, you're going to end up with that same thing, right? We're going to all going to be just uh, cattle, you know, using whatever form of transportation there is to get from A to B instead of having it be an expression of who we are or an expression of, you know, the, the, the things that we believe in. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but there, there, I think there is good news. And I, and I was lucky enough to actually go to um, the launch of Tesla's Cybertruck, right? Uh, and that, to me, from a design standpoint, is like taking a sledgehammer <laughs> to, to current to current design. And I was talking with the lead designer. Do you know who the lead designer is? He used to be at Mazda, right? And apparently, you know, Elon kept coming in to his office and saying, you know, he had some really elegant designs 
uh, and Elon kept coming in, or Elon kept coming in and saying, no, I don't like it, I don't like it. And by the fifth one, it was just, you know, here is this very, like, you know, in your face, you know, bold, uh, you know, like, uh, almost like uh, uh, apocalyptic, right, um, Mad Max design. And that's the one they went with and people lost their, you know what, I mean, people, you know, people love the design of that. And, and, and that is the, almost the exact opposite of what you think of as, as a commoditization, right? It is just so different and so brutal and yet people loved it. So maybe it was, you know, maybe, or people love it. Maybe it is, you know, the pendulum swinging back the other way. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, time, time will definitely tell. I mean, I, or maybe I, you hate it. I don't know. <laughs> You're the designer. I'm just a journalist, dude. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, again, I, you know, far be it from me to kind of pass judgment on something, especially when I haven't seen it in real life. For sure. I don't it's, do that. It's, 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 it's got presence, you know, when that thing pulls up, especially, I don't know how much of that thing will actually be able to, you know, design, even though, you know, knowing that company, they'll push it as far as they can. But when it rolls up, it's got street presence, you know, with those big tires and, and those those really abrupt and angular and angry and, you know, butch angles. It's, it, I mean, yeah, you feel it. Like, I, have, I have deep respect for, you know, the, the courage it takes to sort of redefine the whole thing and do a completely unexpected thing. You know, we're definitely, we're definitely trying to do that at Hyundai. We're not, we're not about um, to, to, it's not about building equity for the brand anymore, I think, or ever really at Hyundai. I've learned how to sort of respect the, the, the Korean, say, strength or quality in sort of reinventing stuff very, very quickly and very, very, um, uh, you know, rapidly <laughs> um, one thing after the next, one year after the next. Um, the, the, the Koreans and the culture there expect a, a really new and shocking thing. They they love the new stuff. They don't they don't they grow tired of 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 things that try to be like other things or whatever. They want the newest and freshest solution. But yeah, and, I, and you so, see it in their design. You know, like that um, that line that runs around the light of the new Sonata, right, where it goes up and then goes into the the the, the, the hood line, and that yeah. you know, and then it lights up, and then the back of it is looks like it's lighting up. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. It's elegant. It's something that's new. It's something that, you know, the first time I saw that car, I was like, wow, you know, that, and especially in a midsize uh, sedan, right? That class is, has always been the most competitive. Uh, yeah. And to do something that is both that elegant and uh, that sexy is really hard. Yeah. I think, um, you know, we do, we do try to find our signature elements in design that that what you mentioned there actually existed on the 2008 model YF Sonata and then the LF Sonata as well. It's, it's a chrome line that comes off the belt line and then goes into the headlight. But on the new one, it, it, it's, it's quite different because it's elongated all the way from the belt line to the inner, inner portion of the headlight, the inboard line of the headlight, which makes it extremely long and flowing and then it, and then it wings back out again. So the execution of it that time was completely different and completely, I think, unexpected. But it was also something that was created as a signature element for that particular car by Hyundai uh, two generations before. It's just um, the rest of the car is completely reinvented, right? So we're not we're not like with BMW. You're you're taking all you know so many years of let's say evolution and signature elements and sort of marching it along. The job is different there versus at, at Hyundai. You have to learn that really it's about reinvention, you know, almost every single year and then trying something new. It's an open book and there are no rules in a way. And it's really to be seen not as a negative for the brand, but actually a positive in, in its recreation. You know, I think to, for me, the magic sauce of Hyundai in a lot of ways is one of them is value, which has always been part of that brand, but more important one. And, and I'd like to know how you do that as a designer is what you're doing is you're taking, um, you know, a regular car and you're making it feel very premium, right? So the price point is competitive with the, the other cars in that segment, but when you see it and when you sit in it, it feels like you're in a premium vehicle. So it feels like you're in, you know, more of a BMW than in, you know, a, 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 a regular family sedan. And, and how, do you, how, does, how does design lend to that feeling? How does that work? Well, I mean, I mean, first of all, absolutely, you're 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 hitting the nail on the head with your with your description there. I think that um, Hyundai has always been sort of 
or wanted to always been known as, you know, more for, for the money kind of thing or more than expected results. I mean, you got you to gotta realize that Hyundai hasn't really been around very long, comparatively speaking to the other automotive manufacturers. And so being that way, um, they have to be looking at themselves. We sort of look at ourselves as the underdog way and um we're not really on the the psyche of the the global the global landscape really as much as say some of these other more well-known brands but in a way being the underdog is it gives you the fight it gives you the the energy it gives you the challenge to constantly offer more more than expected more than than what the, you're, you're paying for in terms of the, the the cost of the vehicle and that's a great way to sort of get on the landscape, to sort of get on the map and get into the psyche of the customer out there that says, wow, you know, their, their discovery actually comes after they purchase the vehicle where they, they know that they've, they've, they've got a, they've got a, a, a deal on, on, on something. But then in the, in the ensuing months or years that they own the vehicle, they become continuously sort of pleased with what they're what they remember as in terms of purchasing the car, so we always have to be sort of like this benchmark plus one, benchmark plus two Roman kind of attitude. You know, if Toyota is doing this, we have to always do this, but offer it at the same price. And and until until you know that price gap sort of shrinks, which it has over the years, we have to maintain sort of this attitude that we have to. We're looking at ourselves as the underdog, but we have to offer more than them in order to sort of be in that in that competitive uh, sort of landscape for, for a product. So obviously, you know, we're living through interesting times, as the Chinese like to say in that proverb, may you live in interesting times. And, uh, you know, you said it uh, before, but you said this could be kind of a reset uh, in terms of, you know, not just the way that nations, but the way that individuals kind of interact. Um, how, how do you see that being reflected in your line of work or do you see that or is it too early maybe? I mean, sometimes you don't know until you're on the other end of it. Well, again, I would say, you know, the, the word is, um, um, it's less about being premium Roman and it's, it's for me more about being relevant. And again, that, that plays into this idea of, of stylist versus designer. You know, we have to evolve into, into a group of people, a group of creatives and engineers that, that are creating products that are actually relevant and solving problems for people versus just superficially styling something for a flash in the pan moment when they buy the vehicle and then it wears off rather quickly. We're looking at a world that um, is thinking a lot about, you know, ride sharing and non ownership and autonomous uh, vehicles. I keep talking to the guys, you know, um, and, and facing a future here whereby if things were truly autonomous, if things were driving around like like horizontal elevators, um, and you weren't you weren't actually control a human being weren't actually controlling the vehicle, you start to realize all the things that you start to remove and eliminate from the from the vehicle, from its you know from the steering wheel to all all of a sudden the profile of the vehicle then now becomes something completely different because you no longer have to use the windshield to see out the thing in order to keep it down the middle of the road. We no longer need rear view mirrors and stuff. So you start to accumulate all of these details that get, that get removed. And then you have to ask the final question, does this, does this, does the design matter? You know, does the, does the shape of the thing really matter anymore? Or should we just be, you know, rolling around in boxes, you know? And so our job um, becomes quite interesting answering that question because uh, in combination with full autonomy, it, it, it uh, starts to strip away the, the reason for being, the reason for being a car designer in the first place. You know, if, I mean, how stupid would it be if you're, if you're sitting next to a Ferrari and you see a guy sitting in a, in a Ferrari that is autonomous, but it looks the same way that it does today, right? It's just an evolution or whatever. And the guy's sitting there in the seat with his arms folded. He's not got his hands on the wheel anymore, but it looks the same way, right? How ridiculous is that? Is that picture in your mind, right? I mean, it, it becomes really, really, you know, disconnected and irrelevant. 
So let's have a little bit of fun uh, before we close this off. All right. And yeah. uh, you know, you're a car guy, I'm a car guy and I spend a lot of time on places oh, like God. Now, is this where it gets difficult, Ron? No, this is where it gets fun. I'm not going to, okay. don't worry. I'm not, I'm not going to put you in any kind of awkward position. Okay. Even though I could do that, but I, won't. I know, I, I, you know, it wouldn't be fair, but let's, let's have a little bit of fun and, yeah. and forget, forget big budgets. Cause like I say, I spend a lot of time on Craigslist. I spend too much time on bring a trailer. I'm going to give you $30,000. Okay. And I'm going to ask you with that $30,000, what car you would buy based on that culture. So, you know, what, what German car would you buy? And it's got to be a classic car or, you know, relatively used. I don't want, we're not going to talk about new cars, but let's start with German $30,000. What German classic car do you buy? What's, what's the one that you put in your garage? Uh, BMW 325i. <laughs> nice. What year? Mm, 85, 84, something like that. Like a, like a, uh, like a, what is that? E30 generation? E30. That one? Yeah. Yeah. We just had one. I had one last year. We bought a convertible for 5,000. Um, yeah. but unfortunately we bought the automatic and that just took the life out of it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got to get the Now manual. ask me the same question for the Italians. All right. Italian. The car that I have out in the garage right now, 1972 Alfa Romeo GTV 2000. Uh, yeah, I was just watching the top here where uh, the boys each bought a, a different car and Jeremy bought that car. How do you even find a GTV? You know, Jeremy Clarkson said that that's got one of the greatest engines of all time. The design is incredible, uh, but it's hard to drive. Apparently, the seating position is weird. That's all at I know. The about. Time, at the time, I was all in the market to buy a 2002, a TI, a 73 TII that I had yeah. taken a test drive in, and I just happened to be coming up the 405 freeway in Torrance at the time, and I had seen that some Somebody was selling the Alpha, and it was at night time. I, I broke all the cardinal rules for buying a used car, right? So it was nighttime. I didn't even test drive the damn thing. All I did was sat in it, and I just was like, oh, man, the position was just like put my elbow out the window or whatever. And I had just been in a 2002, which is more like a bus. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like this driving or whatever, and I just I was sold on it just from the seating position. I said, I got to have this car. So I, had, I, I bought it, and um, – and I drove it for a number of years and then uh, bottomed the car out on the oil pan and uh, it launched the motor off the motor mounts and oh, it's God. sitting in my garage now forever. <laughs> and all my friends, all my colleagues give me a hard time about, oh yeah, when are you going to get that alpha rolling again? So, but, uh, you know, I look at it as a, as a friend out there in the garage and it's, it's, it's one day it's going to get fixed up and I'm going to thumb my nose at everybody. Good for you, man. I, I would... And when you do that, please invite me for a ride because I've always wanted to get behind. The, you know, I grew up in uh, Prague and then my parents uh, moved during the communist time and got to Switzerland. And I remember seeing those things running around Switzerland being like every time I saw one, I was just like, oh, my God, that is just so gorgeous. And apparently the engine note is beautiful. Uh, I'm jealous. I'm very jealous. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, it's, it doesn't have a radio, but I really miss the sound of that car. Roll the window down at about 40 miles an hour in third gear. And um, just everything is perfect in the world, you know. Yeah, I heard. I heard. It's like you can hear the. I said an engine note. I didn't say exhaust note because I, I hear the. You can actually hear everything that's going on in the engine, yeah. which is which is the so double, cool. The, the aluminum block, the double overhead cams. I mean, very very modern motor, very very modern car for its time. So really. All right. All right, let's keep going before we okay. you know, before we end this. How about uh, Asian? What Asian car would you get? You know, Japan, Korea. You, you know, any of the Asian brands. Mm. Oh man, that's a tough. You, know, you catch me on the spot. Uh, Mark IV Supra. That's a very popular uh, one. You, you know, I'm I'm kind of I'm like more simple or whatever. I mean, I always I always admired the Honda S2000. Yeah, yeah, those so, are those are certainly portable. They're something cool. like that. Maybe first generation Miata. Uh, always felt that that, but I, but I kind of have that base covered. If we're if we're gonna collect all these cars, I kind of have that base covered. It's not a roadster, but with the Alpha kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I do. I've always admired that first generation Miata as a classic. So, yeah, and they're you know they started to come up in price for a long time. Um, they were like you know two to five thousand dollar cars, and now those very first gens are starting to really come up because they, you know they made a lot of them and they basically reinvented the British roadster, right? But yeah. but they are incredible cars. I, I, my friend Fred had one when I was growing up. Uh, he had a deer with it, and I was very thankful because at six two, I do not fit in that car. And I'm I'm always, and I'm not trying to say that because I'm tall. I just it just it's not designed for tall guys, right? The Germans yeah. design cars for tall guys. That's true. You know, I think in Asia the people are just a little bit shorter, and so I'm, I I always love them. But I you know I look right into the top of that A pillar, and I, 
It's like that. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. It's, it's no good. All right. Uh, as fours around that. That was a good car to have too as a roadster. So. Yeah. All right, and what what have we forgotten? I think we forgot an American, right? So that's that's gonna be the last one. What 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 American car would you get for thirty k classic? I'm a I'm a Camaro guy. Yeah. Actually. So. Uh, what year? Know, sort of like Coke and Pepsi. There's there's Camaro and Mustang. I've had a, I've had a Mustang in the past, but we won't talk about that one. But um, I've just always been kind of a, a lover of the Camaro. Um, but like what year? The classic ones, like the late sixties or more yeah, modern? The, yeah, sixty eight, sixty nine. The, the square boxy ones, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I I kind of have to go back to that to that era of, of vehicles or whatever. But yeah, the general they, they've done a lot of nice vehicles. I mean, I won't go much much earlier than the sixties, but the Camaro has always been. Uh, something of a of a dream car for me yeah and, and that the great thing about those early camaros is they look good standard or they look good modded right if, if you put yeah. you, you know you could you could you could slope them or you, could, you can slam them you could put big we it, it's just just hard to make them look bad you know? yeah i mean there's for me a kind of common thread of the three cars four cars i've just mentioned or whatever i mean i've always loved the 63 corvette yeah. everybody loves that with the split window everybody can talk about ferraris and, and all that kind of stuff but there's there's some ple there's a certain amount of pleasure about, you know, I bought that Alpha for $4,000, you know, that wow. whole car is mine and it's going to take probably 30 grand to pump into it to get it to where I want it to be anyway. But, but there's a certain amount of satisfaction knowing that, you know, it, it's not a, a, a million dollar car or a $300,000 car or whatever. It's attainable. It, it's all mine. And, and it, it's a lot of satis satisfying to, to, to know that the complete vehicle there. So it's not the exotic direction that I necessarily go. It's sort of the more mainstream kind of thing with the Camaro or the 325 that I, I just appreciate that kind of lovely, you know, call it basic transportation, but sporty and it's got plenty of power and, and go juice, you know? You know, the, for all you guys who are out there watching this who are a little bit younger, the great thing about getting to, to I'm going to say my age, which is in, in his 50s, I don't know how old you are, but is that, that all those cars that, that I lusted after as a kid, uh, for the most part, are now affordable. Not the crazy ones, and I'm not going to be buying a Countach, right? <laughs> but, but all the other cool ones, you know, like I remember, you know, a lot of cars, even IROC Zs, you know, those cars are now really affordable, uh, and they're a quarter or a third of the cost of buying a new car. Uh, and if you yeah. don't have them as your main car, you know, it, it's, it's a great way to spend money and, you know, have the dream car of your childhood. Yeah. I mean, and, and not to, not to, you know, you know, go back to the, to the Hyundai thing or whatever, but in a way as a designer, that's part of the challenge too, is to, is to take a brand that's not necessarily, again, like at the forefront of your, of your imagination necessarily, and be able to be part of a team that can take that, say brand or take products within that brand range and get people excited about, about, about that, you know, that idea of that mainstream kind of a product and even perhaps um, bring back the sedan in a really exciting way. You know, um, I, I don't, I don't, I know that, you know, sedan sales are down or whatever, but I don't believe that they're, they're dead. I think it's going to be, there's going to be a pulse through them and then they're going to come back. I think there's a, there's, there's something to the classic definition that the, Italian Carrosseri and Giugiaro, et cetera, whatever had set forth with regard to two box and three box designs. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I just like that challenge of, of taking something that is normally considered, let's say, quote unquote, a boring kind of a thing and bringing excitement into it and electrifying it and, and really, uh, you know, getting people, you know, capturing people's imaginations. You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. You, you know what's really cool when you think about it, like, you know, uh, cars like the current Veloster N, right? Those will be like the, the cars of our youth, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, right? Where, where yeah. people are looking back at like uh, the second or third or fourth generation Supras or Mazda RX-7s. That's where the Veloster N is going to fall because I think there's this kind of hierarchy of needs. And so, you know, Hyundai, Hyundai is moving up that, right? It's, you can't start with the Veloster N. You got to build a base and then you got to get, people like you and people like, you know, Albert Biermann and, uh, and Peter Schreier. Uh, and, and then you kind of work your way up the ladder until you can actually get to a car like that, that is both, you know, sexy and iconic in some ways with that three door design and, and, and you know, incredible performance. Um, and it's cool to see the brand moving up that ladder. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a great challenge to be part of a group that is, you know, again, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily the, the number one thing that comes to your mind, you know, the, the name Hyundai, but in a way for me, especially when I went from a well-known brand uh, car company into uh, Hyundai, it's a great opportunity for folks like me who are like-minded in that manner to be able to take on a new challenge. It kind of keeps you young too, Roman. I mean, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of uh, embrace the company, the culture, the brand, and be able to help steer it in what you feel is the, is the best direction for its, and, and, it, and hopefully someday to become somewhat of a legend or an icon, you know, um, there's no better feeling because, you know, being part of a brand that's been around for a really long time, the job is to sort of, you know, carry it and maintain it along or whatever and pass it along. But you have a chance at a, at a company like Hyundai to create a legacy and, um, and be part of a, a really cool team of, of people that are kind of like trying to turn s nothing into something in a way, right? So it's really, really great. Well, I can't think of a better way to end this conversation than on that note. Chris, thank you very much for taking your uh, time and, and chatting with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to Hyundai for helping me do this. Niles, thank you for helping us sort this out. And guys, uh, thank you for watching and for listening. And remember, uh, come back to TFLcar.com for more news, views, and of course, real world reviews. See you guys next time. Ciao. Thank you, Chris.